Palestinians have a country, but they're not coming back to Israel. This is accepted. So it's not such a complicated issue to resolve. Okay, those are the four core interests that need to be resolved to have an agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Now we're going to move on to the next level of conflict resolution. We've just talked about practical interests, what an agreement needs to have. Um, yeah. So, we're going to talk about individuals, you and I. When we speak about the role of an individual during conflict, what we are concerned with is a person's limited ability to perceive reality objectively, to think accurately, and to respond rationally. In other words, the limited ability of our perceptions, thoughts, and emotions. Becoming aware of our limited ability to be rational is the first stage in resolving conflicts. Because you need to remember that we create conflicts and we resolve conflicts. Okay. So let's begin with perceptions. According to the principle of naive realism, you have the translation, an individual incorrectly believes that he or she perceives reality objectively, that any rational person will perceive reality in the same way, and that if someone perceives reality differently, they do so because they are dishonest, irrational, ideological, unintelligent, or uninformed. So it's very difficult for us as individuals to understand and accept that other people see reality differently to how we see reality and that their perception can be just as valid. Yep. So we need to realise that our perceptions are subjective. The problem with this is if you do not understand that other people can perceive reality in a different way that is also valid, when you are negotiating, when you are communicating, you will believe that the other person is not a fair negotiator, that they have some bias. You're fair, they're not fair. This creates a lack of trust, a lack of respect, and it creates polarisation in conversation because you don't believe that it's possible to speak fairly and rationally with this person. So it's very important to accept that this person sees reality in a different way and I need to accept that from their point of view, maybe it is just as valid. Yeah. So let's look at some examples. In 1948, Israel declared independence. The Arab countries invaded and hundreds of thousands of Palestinians lost their land. So. Today, any Israeli who is younger than 86 years old was a child when that decision to declare independence was made. That means that almost the entire population of Israel was a child when, the, when those policies were made, which means they are not responsible for those decisions. So. This means that when you tell an Israeli who is less than 86 years old that they have no right to this land, this land is for the Arabs, Palestinians, Jews have no right to be here, you shouldn't be here, that is the same as me telling you that you have no right to live in Colombia. It's the same. It's the only home they ever known and they were children when the decision was made. However, from the Palestinian point of view, it's not important who made the decision, when the decision was made, how old the people are. It's irrelevant. What's important is something of theirs was taken and they want it back. So which of these two points of view are valid? 
truth is, both of them are valid. And in order to begin communicating, that needs to be accepted. It's not accepted in Israel and Palestine. Neither side accepts the other side's version, which is why there is no communication. Another example from Colombia. In regards to the plebiscite from a few weeks ago, and especially the issue of impunity, from one point of view, granting amnesty to people that have committed terrible crimes sends the wrong message to other groups or other people who might take this as a lesson that they can achieve their objectives through violence. But from another point of view, generally speaking, in all peace processes around the world, some degree of amnesty is required to solve the conflict. So again, which point of view is valid? Both are valid. And to achieve constructive outcomes in this conversation, the two sides with these two points of view will need to accept that the other side has an opinion that really is valid, even though it's not my opinion. This is not easy. This requires a high level of social intelligence, reflection, analysis, and most of all, a willingness to be wrong, which is very rare, including myself. So we need to approach conversations without the desire to be right. Okay, next. The next limitation is related to our thoughts. We have evolved cognitive shortcuts they are part of our psychology to help us make decisions very quickly without analysing all of the information in the environment. The problem is that many times these decisions are incorrect. It's necessary to make quick decisions without analysing all the time. If you analysed everything before you made a decision, you would not be alive. You would have been hit by a car, you, you would have fallen down a cliff, because it would have taken too long to step back. You would have analysed, if I fall, how high is it, will I die, and yeah, you would fall. So we make decisions very quickly to save our life, but very often they're incorrect decisions. Let's look at some examples. Okay, yeah. This translates to availability bias. There is extensive scientific research which shows that people believe something to be, sorry, something to have a higher probability if it is easy for them to remember the same event occurring in the past. So let me ask you a question. We'll see who's awake. Which are you more afraid of? Shark attacks or falling out of bed? Shark attacks. Anyone falling out of bed? Really? Really? Okay. You're smarter than everyone here. So, almost everybody, not everybody, is more afraid of shark attacks. Now, in the year 2012, in Australia, where we have many sharks, very scary, two people died from shark attacks in the year 2012. Two. In the same year, 58 people died from falling out of bed. <laughs> but which are you more afraid of? Shark attacks, except for you. And this is because the image of shark attacks is so available in your mind that you overestimate the probability of it actually occurring. And probably before today, you had never imagined that you could die falling out of bed. I have. Uh, yeah. Another example. In the Palestinian territories, Gaza, the West Bank, remember the, the yellow, almost all of the contact that Palestinian children have 
with Israelis is with Israeli soldiers. So when you ask a Palestinian child to draw a picture of an Israeli, not an, not an Israeli soldier, draw a picture of an Israeli, this is what you get. A picture of an angry soldier with a big gun. The children believe that this represents every Israeli because of the availability of this image in their mind. And you can imagine that this creates a lot of problems for conflict resolution. So these biases, this inability to think rationally, is very problematic during conflict. And I'm sure if you try, you can see how this is happening in Colombia as well. This one translates to confirmation bias. This is the tendency to search for and easily accept evidence that supports the way you already see the world and to ignore evidence that challenges the way you already see the world. During conflict, confirmation bias means that any time your enemy does something bad, it's proof it's evidence that your enemy is bad. But when your enemy does something good, it is not proof that your enemy is good because you already believe your enemy is bad. For example, if you believe that you cannot trust the FARC, you will look for evidence that supports this belief and you will ignore evidence that challenges this belief. Okay, one more bias. Representative bias. This bias means that we estimate, we guess, the probability of an event by comparing it to the typical case that exists in our mind. So let's look at an example. Maria. Imagine a girl named Maria. Is there a Maria here? Yeah, it must be. Maria listens to New Age music. She reads her horoscope every day. She enjoys aromatherapy and meditation. Based on this description, is Maria more likely to be a school teacher on the left or a yoga teacher on the right? Yoga, yoga, yeah, yoga. Yep, yeah, thank you. Yes, everybody answers yoga. I answered yoga. But the answer is school teacher. The reason is because there are many, many more school teachers than there are yoga teachers. So the probability is still higher that Maria is a school teacher. But because of the description, you had a representation of the typical case, the typical description, which is a yoga teacher. But for one yoga teacher, there maybe is 100 school teachers. So statistically, Maria is more likely to be a school teacher. But we all guess wrong. So these are only a few examples of biases the way that your mind has shortcuts. Okay? Oh, you're ahead of me. So, next we'll talk about emotions. Okay? We talked about perceptions, we talked about thoughts, now we're talking about emotions. Our emotions have evolved over millions of years for the purpose of keeping us alive in the short term and for reproduction of the species. This is the evolutionary purpose of your emotions. Our emotions did not evolve to help us solve complex, long-term problems. And they did not evolve to help us solve complex conflicts. Because this requires analysis, planning, and long-term thinking. 
And during conflict, our emotional reactions are not the same as planning long-term thinking. Okay. No, sorry. A logical place to start with our emotions is the amygdala. If you can see in the left picture, this red area, this is the amygdala. This is a part of your brain. It's in the center of your brain. When the amygdala senses danger in the environment, it hijacks. Does that make sense? Hijacks? Yep. It takes over your brain to make you respond quickly without thinking. Your amygdala works outside of your control because if it waited for your permission, you would not survive. It's, just, it's, it's similar to what we were talking about before with making you act quickly to keep you alive. Uh, if you see a lion, Leon, yeah, Leon, yeah, in the distance, you think it's a lion, do you wait to, is it a lion? Kind of looks like a lion, but maybe it's a bit, five seconds, you're dead. So your brain has evolved this part of your brain to say, lion, it's probably a lion, run. Later, when you're safe, maybe you can, back in the car, you say, ah, it's a bush. But it's better to know that later. This is how the amygdala works. It makes you act and ask questions later. The problem is that on many occasions, your amygdala makes you respond when there is no danger, when the danger is small danger, or where there is a danger, but your reaction is something that feels good in that moment, but in the long term, it's not a good response. I hope this makes sense. So, for conflict resolution, it's very important to understand how the amygdala works. So you can understand when you do something irrational, destructive, without thinking, and you can understand and be more forgiving of other people who respond in a destructive way. We need to remember that in many occasions the amygdala is in control. Humiliation. This is the most dangerous emotion in conflict. A person who feels humiliated becomes obsessed with revenge, and this revenge often involves violence, torture, rape, genocide, etc. This is even worse when humiliation is combined with anger. So, after World War II, the Germans were humiliated with the signing of the agreement, and we got the Nazis and the worst genocide in modern times. In, if you look to the right, in Israel and Palestine, Palestinians who feel humiliated by the Israeli occupation are easily convinced into joining terrorist organizations such as Hamas, Islamic Jihad, etc. And they are easily convinced into becoming suicide bombers. As you can see, even a child. This is not a real bomb, but it's glorifying a child with a suicide bomb. Uh, this also applies to Colombia. I've seen not many, but a few interviews with members of the FARC who explain that the primary reason that they joined this organization was because they felt humiliated by the oppression and by the poverty of the society. By joining extreme organizations, people who feel humiliated find an opportunity to feel powerful, to feel valuable, to feel strong, to have the opportunity to take revenge they become the aggressor instead of the victim. So, some recommendations. 
during conflict, we have to calm down and allow the thinking part of our brain to take control back from the amygdala. We have to use our emotions intelligently to find long-term solutions rather than responding to our immediate emotional reaction. We also need to avoid humiliating people because, as we've seen, humiliation becomes the primary reason for revenge. And humiliation is an emotion that can last decades, generations. If the other side already feels humiliated, we need to develop strategies to increase their dignity. And this will decrease the desire for revenge. In general, we need to understand that our emotions are often not helpful during conflict. And we need to pay more attention to educating our society on how to use emotions intelligently. Yep. Okay. Some final thoughts on the individual. We have seen that our perceptions of reality are not objective, that our thoughts are not always accurate and that our emotions are not always rational. So when you are thinking about why a conflict is so difficult to resolve, you must keep in mind the role of the individual, not just the agreement. Okay. We're almost there. The third level. The third level is the society. At this level, we are going to talk about the effects of tribalism, shared beliefs, political limitations, and religious fundamentalism, and why, for societies, conflict resolution is so difficult. Yeah. So let's begin with tribalism. Tribalism is the feeling of belonging to a group. This group could be a country, a religion, a football team, a group of friends, the most obvious is your family. This group usually has its own identity. It has a name, a logo, a song, a hero. It also has an enemy or enemies. In fact, tribes only exist for the purpose of deciding who is in the tribe, who is not in the tribe. This feeling of tribalism, of belonging to a group, is completely natural. It's programmed into your DNA. For thousands of years, throughout evolution, if you did not belong to a tribe, you would not have survived. Tribes formed to defeat bigger animals, bigger threats. This is the only reason that humans are alive today, because we form groups. So, it's completely natural, this feeling. However, during conflict, because of our group loyalty, our tribalism, we find it much easier to forgive our side, our tribe, for the things that they do wrong,